And I unmuted myself. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Digital Hammurabi. This is very excitingly our first interview. Sorry, something's sleeping on my computer. This is our first round of interviews for HAPS 2020. Um, if you're not familiar with it, I did put a video out earlier, to, uh, not today, yesterday, um, about exactly what HAPS is. But HAPS is the summer scholarship program that we run. Um, and we fundraise all year for it. And last year we were very pleased to raise just under $7,000, which meant that we could fund three graduate students at $2,000 each uh, to complete some summer research projects. Um, if you're not familiar with grad school, then I should tell you now that it is A, expensive, B, very poorly paid, um, and C, they don't tend to give you any kind of money. Josh is... <laughs> I don't know if anyone just heard anything I was saying, uh, but hi, now I have a microphone in front of me. We are absolutely the coolest people Oh, ever. we're the best people. Like, you won't believe how long we spent this morning getting this thing set up and I still forget to put the mic in front of my face. Yeah, anyway. Was, the rest of it was my fault though. Okay, I'm going to mute. <laughs> Josh says it was his fault. Um, hi, nice to see you all. Uh, this is the first interview for HAPS 2020. HAPS is our summer scholarship program aimed at PhD students working on some aspect of the ancient Near East, that is Mesopotamia, Egypt, the Levant, um, the wider Mediterranean, uh, including archaeology, art history, Assyriology, Hebrew Bible, really anything in that kind of area. Um, well, the reason we decided to do a summer program for grad students is that uh, universities often do not pay stipends over the summer months, um, which leaves students to either seek grant, external grant sources like this one, um, take out loans, which is definitely less than ideal, or take on additional employment, uh, which is also less than ideal because it uh, prolongs the amount of time you then have to spend in grad school because you're spending your time working so you can pay your rent rather than working on your field work, your research, your dissertation, getting that done so you can graduate. Um, so yes, we provide $2,000 grants for graduate students to complete summer research projects. Uh, this can be anything from going on fieldwork, excavation kind of things, uh, to archival research, to just staying at home and writing up their dissertations. Um, because you do still have to pay rent while you do all of those things uh, and buy food. And even if you're not going somewhere, even if you're not um, like traveling to conferences or paying hotel bills, you do still need some kind of income while you're you're writing your research up. So that is what we're doing. That's why we're here. Um, and one of the uh, key things for us is to introduce uh, interested non-specialists, that's you guys, to academic research. So we do ask that all of our applicants are willing to come on the channel and have an interview so that you can ask them your questions. Um, they can explain some of their research. Um, and then successful applicants, people who are given the grants, then come back after their summer to kind of debrief, report back, let you know, excuse me, how it all went. Um, yeah, so we are starting the process. It's very exciting. Uh, we have um, our first applicant in the waiting room, so I'm going to let her in. Um, if there's a little bit of a technical snafu, forgive me. This is my first time doing it in this particular manner, but hopefully, hopefully it will work. We're just going to... Uh, Wait for one second until the computer catches up with us. Aha! We have a person. Hello, Emily. Lovely to meet you. <laughs> oh, exactly. Every day. It's like... Oh, and that's entirely the wrong screen. Um, so everybody, this is uh, Emily Booker. She is a PhD student at Brown University. Um, Emily, would you mind telling us um, kind of how you got into the field and a bit about yourself? Really? Of about 50 people 
on uh, Near Eastern art and archaeology with Dr. Marion Feldman. And she's the boom, best, isn't she? She's, she's fabulous. And I, I absolutely fell in love with it. Mm. I just, and since at that moment, uh, about halfway through my second semester, as I took that class, I knew exactly what I wanted to major in. So I ended up doing a double major in classical civilizations and Near Eastern civilizations mm -hmm. with a focus on art and archaeology. So my background is really a combination of archaeology, so really looking at the material remains, but also art history, so thinking mm. about the visual and artistic aspects of them as well. Wonderful, thank you. Um, yeah. Could you just let us know what your current area of specialization is as a PhD <laughs> student? Yeah, so um, my general kind of larger, more breadth uh, specialization is on the archaeology of the Eastern Mediterranean, particularly the Levantine coast, so the Syro Palestine, as well as Cyprus uh, during the second millennium BCE. This is about the middle and late Bronze Age, so 2000 to 1000 BCE, um, and especially the late Bronze Age, 1650 to 1050 BCE. This is a time of an efflorescence of cross cultural interaction and exchange. There's these huge trade networks that pop up that reach all the way from Mesopotamia, so modern day Iraq all the way to the island of Sardinia, west of Italy. Um, and these trade networks have these amazing material remains. There's awesome uh, um, underwater shipwrecks, like the Ulubarun shipwreck off the coast of uh, southern Turkey. This is mm. a great example of this, of these giant trade networks. And it's really interesting to see um, how this really changes life in Cyprus and uh, Syro-Palestine, because they're kind of right in the middle of all of these things happening are right in the middle of all of these big kingdoms. So the Hittites in Anatolia, modern day Turkey, um, the um, Assyrian um, empire in Mesopotamia and the Egyptian empire, especially during the Amarna period, I think right before King Tut mm. uh, in Egypt. And so it's really interesting to see how um, these smaller kingdoms in Cyprus and Syro Palestine um, interact with and react to these larger forces and these this kind of big explosion of trade and contact. Mm -hmm. um, more specifically for my dissertation, I'm looking at the contextual use and meaning of clay figurines on Cyprus, particularly anthropomorphic figurines, meaning um, figurines with visual similarities to the human body on the island of Cyprus during the late Bronze Age. So during this time of um, cultural exchange and trade, um, the things I'm interested in are questions of how figurines can reflect Cypriot understandings of the body and what it means to be human and how this may um, kind of also reflect the shifts in Cypriot life that um, are impacted by the changes in social structure and political structure and economies due to increased trade networks. Um, so that's kind of my focus, looking at uh, a thing I really like to do is looking at the small objects. So in this case, figurines, which are mm, usually this handheld mm. in size. Um, I've also looked at a lot of cylinder seals on Cyprus, looking at the small objects to understand how the minute can tell us more about these much broader understandings and um, things that happen. Mm -hmm. um, instead of looking just at the big picture, looking at the small to understand the little aspects of it. So when you're, when you're looking at these figurines, what kinds of, of places, what kinds of contexts do you find them in? Uh, so my dissertation is looking at some um, site case studies. So six specific sites that have been really well excavated in Cyprus. Um, and within these sites, so there's a bias towards coastal sites, so really large sites. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of keep that in mind as I'm talking about this, that this isn't necessarily true for all the figurines in Cyprus, but for the ones that I'm looking at, at these larger coastal sites that seem to be political powers in the late Bronze Age on Cyprus, they are in a mix of contexts. Uh, some are in more, you think of ritual contexts, so temple contexts, um, this is especially true at the site of Enkemi, where you have these giant temple precincts and these really interesting large um, deposits, just these areas that people just put a bunch of clay figurines into. There's like mm. 10 or 20 in the like, little deposits. Uh, really interesting, very unique. And then you also find them in a lot of domestic contexts. So the places that people live and where they cook and um, 
they, you know, especially areas where I would associate with women's work in the late Bronze Age, weaving um, and um, cooking work, things mm -hmm. like that, and also in more administrative contexts. So um, places for storage. Um, there's been a couple places where figurines have been found in areas where they've also found um, uh, Cipro Minoan tablets. Cipro Minoan is the script that is um, used for writing in Cyprus during the Late Bronze Age. Really interesting thing about it is that we still have no idea what it says, <laughs> <laughs> which it's just also kind That's of a always fun, fun part. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of a fun part of the picture. We actually call um, the um, second half of the second millennium BCE in Cyprus the proto-historic period because historic, usually when we refer to prehistoric, we mean things prior to written records, mm -hmm. but in Cyprus, because we have writing, but we just don't understand it, it doesn't really count as prehistory, so proto, you know, it kind <laughs> of, it, it works for it, right? <laughs> that is interesting that you, they're almost ubiquitous across such a large um, selection of, of contexts. Um, do you have, and I am definitely putting the cart before the horse here, so if we're going way too far afield, then tell me um yeah. do you have any kind of like theories as to why they're found in in so many different areas i i mean it changes every time i look at my data mm -hmm. and i look at it in a different angle but um some of the theories i'm kind of thinking of right now is um that these figurines are kind of a a symbolic representation of Cypriot humans. They're not necessarily gods, I don't think, at least the ones that look like humans. Mm. There are also a lot, there's even more um, bull figurines than um, anthropomorphic figurines in Cyprus. And I think maybe the bull ones are more of the um, divine figurines. Um, but the human ones, I think, maybe are serving as a way, kind of like we see uh, Barbie dolls and toy soldiers in the contemporary world, mm -hmm. they're ways for people to negotiate and understand what it means to be human. And also, especially for children, looking at them as a way to say, this is an ideal of a human adult, mm -hmm. a, like a stereotypical female adult. This is the ideal. Uh, just like, you know, in the um, mid 20th century, Barbie with, you know, the beautiful makeup and hair mm -hmm. and dresses was this kind of ideal American woman. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of what I'm going with right now, but it changes. Awesome. Thank you. So, um, yeah. So if you, you are successful in your, your HAPS application, what do you plan on, on using the money to fund? What research projects do you have coming up this summer? Right. Well, uh, originally it was going to help fund my travel and stay in Cyprus as part of uh, my excavation field work. I'm part of a field project, the Calabasas and Lurani Built Environments Project uh, through Cornell University and University of British Columbia. Um, but that is unfortunately not going to happen this yeah. summer. Um, so uh, actually, it, it ends up that um, I actually need perhaps funding more than I thought I would. Um, because I'm no longer going to Cyprus, that means I don't have an income for the summer at mm -hmm. all. Um, and so what I would do with the HAPS funding and my plan for summer research is really continuing to write my dissertation mm -hmm. and being able to do a deep dive into the data and do a lot of library research. I think one thing that doesn't get talked a lot about within academia and what especially archaeologists and um, museum studies people do is that a lot there's been already so much discovered and excavated that hasn't been studied mm -hmm. and Actually, all of the figurines that I'm studying, all these case studies uh, of these sites, uh, they've already been excavated. And so it actually allows me to do a lot of um, the research and analysis outside of the field, which now is very fortunate. Yeah. Um, but also, um, I think that it's a way to kind of limit the amount of things we're taking out without doing any actual analysis of the material. And I, th I think that's an excellent point. And, and you're right, it's something that doesn't get talked about enough in the field. And it's definitely something that I don't think is translated to, to non-specialists. Mm -hmm. um, there is so much that is produced, so much information that's produced from just one 
one season, so one summer of field work that it's yes. it's virtually impossible to publish it. it. Well, you can't publish it in the following year because you're teaching, you're studying, you've got your own research exactly. to do. Um, so a, a lot of the time it kind of sits until someone has the time, sometimes the enforced downtime uh, where yeah. you can't, you can't excavate. Um, exactly. So it, it's really, it's useful to have that, um, that time, that opportunity, and especially that funding, because I feel a lot of funding opportunities are very focused on um, like funding field work or funding yes. specific travel or going yes. to conferences. Uh, so having, I, I know, and I'm stressing this for our audience because writing doesn't sound terribly exciting, but actually it is literally the most important thing you can do as a grad student is write up your research um, because that's the only way that you get it um, to other researchers, you get it to non-specialists, to people who are interested in, in what, you're, what you're discovering and, and what your theories are. Um, so having the financial freedom to be able to go to a library and sit and write and go to the archives and do the the at home research you need to do is actually um incredibly important um so thank you um we are just about halfway into emily's interview so now it's probably the time for me to bring in josh who is going to ask any audience questions that we've had because last year i did not leave enough time for audience questions so <laughs> they're always very interested in what people have to say so josh hi. you should be unmuted hey. excellent hey emily hi josh nice to virtually meet you yeah nice to meet you too so i just wanted to say before we get to the uh the, the questions, you know, for the audience, one of the things that we see, and Emily, I'm sure you see this just as you interact with people, one of the things we see on social media all the time is a neglect of the secondary literature. So, you know, I, I just want to sort of emphasize what Megan was saying, the ability to sit in a library and um, be consumed with what other people have written on a topic before you yeah. is absolutely critical um, for any number of reasons. One, so that you're not duplicating work that's already been done. Um, but probably more importantly, because, um, you know, I think just for me, uh, looking at how other people have come to the data, the different angles that they've taken, the different approaches can often lead uh, the researcher to say, oh, I can, if I come at that angle slightly modified to this different part of the data, yeah. Um, actually, it could be very useful. So, oh, yeah, I just definitely. Yeah, I've taken a lot of influence actually from work on uh, Mayan uh, figurines, actually, and mm. some of the stuff that uh, people like Rosemary Joyce are doing. It's fascinating, actually, what you can kind of bring across from uh, different but parallel fields. Exactly. Um, yeah, I love uh, cross cultural studies and things like that. That absolutely fascinate me. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Josh, carry on. No, absolutely. <laughs> you, you're good. So I have one question. And uh, anybody out there, if you have other questions, please uh, tag me at Digital Hammurabi. Uh, but Lieutenant Galloway asks, did the late Bronze Age see a rise in decentralization of societies, such as the Sea Peoples? And if so, is it more difficult to attribute material provenance? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the Sea Peoples are very difficult to unpack. Uh, it's kind of this big mystery thing. Um, in my opinion, what really happens in the late Bronze Age is with the movement of material goods and um, trade, you also have the movement of people. Um, I think you see this in a lot of different places throughout the Mediterranean. You see settlements of or Greek populations in Cyprus, you even see this in a little bit um, in earlier in the second millennium in um, Egypt, you kind of see movements of people from zero Palestine into Egypt, you have a lot of movement of people everywhere. And I think this can kind of be attributed a little bit to the sea peoples and kind of what happens, especially we see in these monumental reliefs from Egypt is a lot of times what people are referring to when they talk about the sea peoples. Um, there's a lot of talk also about the environmental impact that was happening at the time and people were moving around trying to find new places to live, but I definitely don't claim to be an expert on um, kind of this end of the late Bronze Age and what exactly happens and who the sea peoples are. Um, 
but I think that uh, thinking about provenance of materials is a really interesting question in the late Bronze Age, because one of the things you do see is uh, this efflorescence of an artistic style that kind of has doesn't look like anything you've seen before. It's a con combination between Egyptian, Mesopotamian, Greek styles, and you can't really tell where it was made. Um, uh, my undergraduate advisor, Dr. Marion Feldman, actually termed this um, the um, late Bronze Age Koine and in internationalism style, where um, all of these elite powers throughout the Mediterranean are all using the same iconography and styles um, for their objects. And so it becomes really unclear when you find an object um, in this internationalist style, say in Mycenae, Greece, um, was it made in Greece? Was it made in Egypt? Was it made in Mesopotamia? And that, those are a bunch of unknowns because also the objects that these artistic styles are in, um, the materials that they draw from are from throughout the Mediterranean. Um, so Cyprus is really known for copper. Um, cop um, they've done um, scientific studies on copper and I don't know exactly what they're called. So I would have to ask a friend, maybe it's XRF analysis. Um, they might be able to do some XRF scans on copper, but they found Cypriot copper in Italy and Sardinia um, being used to make things. And mm -hmm. so there's also not only a movement of pre-made objects, but a movement of materials to make these objects. So everything kind of becomes this wishy-washy. We don't know where things are from. And also people are using um, and consuming materials and objects made throughout the Mediterranean. So I, I think of it a lot as like a parallel to now today, as kind of globalism that we have and the objects that we use and made from everywhere and the materials that they're made from are from other places as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> so actually, uh, we have several more that came in. So, uh, Megan, just kind of keep me on track with sure. time. We'll try to get, uh, audience members. We'll try to get as many as we can. So chip asks, can you describe the process used to assign the chronological order of the figurines found at the various sites? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a very good question and one that's tough. So the way that there are two kind of different methods of, um, Look, um, defining the chronological order of figurines in Cyprus or anywhere in the archaeological record. The first is through typology, so stylistic trends um, and kind of what you see, the ways in which uh, figurines are made. Are they more, are they made on a wheel? So wheel made just like pots. Are they handmade? The types of decoration on them, how big they are, the types of attributes, say eyes, ears, noses that are included, these types of typologies can all be put together to then create a kind of timeline of the changes and trends in figurines. But attached to that, and I think way more important, is um, the archaeological chronology and the stratigraphy. So um, in um, archaeology, um, the main way we date things is through relative dating through excavation. And so we have stratigraphic layers. The main uh, importance of stratigraphy is that the things below are older than the things on top. And so as you excavate down, say you find a figurine here um, and it has certain uh, kind of trends, you know, and then you keep excavating and you find another figurine down here, you know that this one, unless there's something weird going on, say somebody dug a pit and put things back in, but you can still see that in the dirt itself, which is something I love about archaeology. Just stare at dirt, <laughs> and learn things. Um, but you can pretty much say with certainty that the one here, the figurine here, is older than the figurine up here. And so that's why looking at excavation reports really closely and looking at things just like uh, the depth of wh where things were, um, where figurines are found is really important because it helps us kind of trace. Um, more of the timeline of these figurines where they're found and about and um, kind of shift some of the trends because sometimes um, figurine typologies 
are created um, with uh, artifacts, with figurines that don't have an archaeological context. These are things that have either been excavated in the late 20, um, in, excuse me, the late 19th century, and they just didn't record anything, or were looted and sold on the market, um, now the black market. And so we don't have any of the uh, provenience information um, and assemblage information that is really crucial to understand the meaning of these figurines. So by looking at the relative dating, um, within archaeological excavation, we can better understand the typology and get a chronology, if that makes sense. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, definitely. Um, all right, so how are we doing on time? Uh, yeah, we're good. We've got 10 minutes. Perfect. Okay. So Donna Noble asks, are material analyses planned to find out where the figurines come from? Um, so my research isn't planned on looking at exactly where the figurines are coming from, but other people have done this really successfully. What you can do is it's called petrographic analysis. So for clay figurines, because they're made out of clay, um, they have very specific types of uh, mineral contents. So what you can do is you take a little chip off of one. I know that seems like, oh gosh, you're taking a chip off of an artifact, but it can tell you a lot by a little bit of destruction can tell you a lot. Actually, one of the things I first learned about archaeology is archaeology is a science of destruction. You have to destroy in, a, in order to learn more, unfortunately. It's quite unsettling the first time you actually work that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like, why, first... why don't we just excavate everything? And then a professor says, well, if we do that, there will be nothing left for future people <laughs> with better technology to excavate. Exactly. Like, so uh, back to the petrographic analysis. So what you do is you take like a small little sample, um, you take a little like clean cut of the clay, um, and then you look at it underneath a microscope. And through that, you can look at the different kind of mineral composition of it. And through that, an analysis of different clay and soil areas throughout the entire world, you can kind of guess based on similarities where a clay is found, um, where a clay comes from. So from there, you can tell where the clay that was used to create the figurine was taken from. Usually, it's, um, we're under the assumption that clays are um, taken locally. They're sourced locally because it seems weird to ship clay well, across the Mediterranean. Yeah, yeah, that seems kind of weird. Um, but who knows? Maybe we're completely wrong. Um, <laughs> that's the fun thing about archaeology. Um, one person finds this new thing and completely flips the entire understanding of things. I think it's really cool. It's like this big puzzle. Um, but so through this petrographic analysis, you can kind of get an idea of where the clay is from and thus likely where these figurines were made. Um, you can also use stylistic analysis um, and production analysis to understand where things are made as well. So different places have different types of artistic um, production that they like to use. So in the late Bronze Age, um, in Greece, they have a very particular way. They have these psi figurines that kind of, they, they're like, woo, they're, uh, they, and they're painted in a very particular geometric way, and they're very small, like this big, whereas in Cyprus, the um, anthropomorphic figurines that you see are have more of the, they're less ab abstracted, they have more similarities to the human body, they're usually uh, nude females actually, and they're much bigger, they're about this big. And so by these different stylistic and production um, uh, typologies and trends, you can also get a general idea of where a figurine was made and where it's from. But again, because the late Bronze Age sees so much trade and um, uh, the movement of materials and people, that something could have been made somewhere specifically to be used by people elsewhere, elsewhere. which I think is really interesting. You see this in Cyprus, Cy uh, Cypriot elites love using um, Greek craters. They're these giant wine um, pots. They're specifically used to mix um, concentrated wine with water. They only use Greek ones. They do not use locally made ones. So they, there are people in Greece that are producing craters 
to be shipped to Cyprus, which I think is fascinating, mm -hmm. really interesting. So, so again, um, the late Bronze Age creates this really cheeky, confusing thing that I think is just fascinating and speaks to how interesting it is. And again, is an interesting parallel to today. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question, Josh. Okay. So Chip asks, how did the deity worship change over the 600 years of the late Bronze Age? And how did the Bronze Age collapse affect the construction of the figurines? It's a very good question. Um, there, it's difficult to understand um, the kind of um, the religious aspects of Cypriot life, um, especially in comparison to Egypt and uh, Anatolia in Mesopotamia, because of the lack of written records. And even in comparison to Greece as well, because they have linear A and linear B, and we understand those both to an extent. And so it's a little more difficult for us to really understand what's going on in the kind of religious belief system mm -hmm. in Cyprus during the time. Um, but there are two examples of clearly cult statues. Uh, these are both found at the site of Enkemi, um, which is on the... Uh, eastern coast of Cyprus. It's now on the northern, it's, a, it's north of the, um, the border in Cyprus. Um, and um, so there we have these two large temple precincts and two bronze statuettes, um, meaning that they're much bigger than a figurine. They can't be handheld hand in size. I'd say they're probably about two feet tall, about. Um, uh, and um, so these uh, statuettes, one is called the Horned God and the other is called the Ingot God. Um, they are very finely made. Bronze is the most um, valuable material in the late Bronze Age. Hence the name the Bronze Age is because bronze really becomes some of the most valuable materials. And Cyprus, importantly, produces a lot of copper. And so, which is one of the key ingredients, copper and iron together, or excuse me, Copper and tin. Sorry. Ooh, boy. <laughs> Mixing up everything today. <laughs> Copper and tin together. Doing this on the spot is, is tricky. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great experience for me, though, you know. <laughs> um, but um, so, so these are clearly deity statues, and they take a lot of Mesopotamian influence, actually, because they have these um, horned headdresses. The horns go up, and this is a very common trope in Mesopotamian art to depict deities, gods. Um, and um, they're also standing in this really interesting, what's called a smiting pose, that it has similarities to Egyptian gods and especially Egyptian deified kings. Um, so it's this weird thing, but we know that these are clearly gods. These are cult statues. And so this create, creates big questions of, well, what else is important? What else is, uh, what else is their religion? What, are the figurines themselves deities? Um, a lot of the scholarship has said, especially the nude female figurines, are likely um, a version of a female fertility figure. They're often called Astarte figurines. Astarte is a zero Palestine goddess. Um, and so they say that um, a lot of scholars argue that that's kind of the Cypriot version of that. Um, but I'm more of the opinion that because of this emphasis on bulls and bull horns um, at the temple precincts, especially the horned god temple precinct, there are, I think, 20 bull skulls that were found in the cult room. So to me, that says that bulls mm -hmm. and cows are very, very important. And actually, during the late Bronze Age, Cyprus had a large population of cows, which they are not endemic to the island at all. They are, they were imported. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really interesting. So to me, I think that the bull figurines are much likely to be small little um, acrotropaic um, cult figurines that you kind of just have around the house. Um, and um, so that's kind of the thing. So it's really unknown and I don't really have any conclusions on the cultic practices in Cyprus. But as far as the changes in uh, figurines go and the changes in cult practices, um, you do see more of a shift towards Greek styles of production. In the late Bronze Age, Cyprus incorporates the potter's wheel from Greece. Um, 
before about 1500, they weren't using the potter's wheel. Everything was handmade. And so you do see an increase in um, potter's wheel being used for figurines as well as more stylistic similarities in the painting technique um, and more abstraction of the human body towards the end of the late Bronze Age. Um, and then from there, there's this big question mark throughout the Eastern Mediterranean at the very end of the late Bronze Age, at about 1000 BC, what happens? Um, from the evidence in Cyprus, there are a lot of large um, political centers on the coast that still keep kicking and they do totally fine, um, but they seem to have more similarities with a lot of um, Greek um, artifacts and um, the idea of kind of the Greek paraphernalia of pottery and artistic production. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thank you for answering all of our questions and thank you for joining us. Um, well, thank you. We are going to take one minute just to reconfigure everybody and then we will move on to our next applicant. So Emily, thank you again, everybody. Thank you for your wonderful questions and we thank will be in touch much. soon. Yes. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this. Good. Bye. All right. Bye. Okay then. That was awesome. I like a good figurine. Um, again, thank you all for your questions. These are very excellent and I am excited to see what else we have. So um, I am going to add in our next applicant. Let's get that. There we go. And I have to unmute him so that everybody can hear. Um, it's Dan, it is saying you do not have a microphone connected. How about now? Ah, there we go. Perfect. Yeah. Wonderful. Everybody. Oh, and I still have, sorry, I need to change the name out because currently it's telling everyone that you are in fact Emily and you are not. Everybody, this is Daniel Plakov, uh, again, coming to us from Brown University. Dan, hi and welcome. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course. Um, would you mind just giving us uh, a bit of information about yourself, um, exactly uh, how you got into the field maybe, and then we'll go from there. Sure. So I'm Dan. Uh, I'm a fourth year uh, PhD student in the Joukowsky Institute for Archaeology in the Ancient World uh, at Brown University. And um, yeah, I'm an archaeologist. I, I, I studied archaeology in undergrad. I studied it um, for my master's at Boston University. And I've worked um, primarily in the Mediterranean, but I've worked in, in Greece and Turkey and Israel, um, Italy. Um, and now I'm working in Peru and in Jordan at Petra, which is the, the research I'll be talking about today. And so I guess, I, I mean, yeah, I got into archaeology not through any kind of profound <laughs> sort of singular moment, but just through always having an interest in, in history and the past. And um, I was very fortunate to kind of be around lots of museums when I was growing up. I grew up right outside of New York City. Um, and so I sort of experienced the past primarily through, through stuff, through things, through material culture. Um, and so then it was sort of a fairly easy decision to just you know, when I was looking for colleges to look for archaeology programs and to, to kind of access the past that way. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Uh, so what is your, your current, um, you said uh, Peru and, and Jordan, what's your current um, maybe uh, focus or area of specialization for your PhD? Yeah. So my, my research focuses on agriculture, ancient agricultural systems, um, and specifically landscape. And so I'm interested in how people use the land through time, um, what, you know, what are they growing with it, how are they modifying it, and really what the legacies of those changes are um, up to the present day. So I'm not necessarily interested in specifically like Roman agriculture or Byzantine agriculture, but really everything up to the present. Um, and so this has been really useful at Petra because you know, Petra is um, you know, a world famous iconic site that's most famous for its, its monuments and its temples and for being in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And uh, it, it's very much known as this caravan city, that it, it became prosperous and it, it, it um, was settled because it was at the intersection of all these international trade routes. Um, and that's definitely part of its story, but there are also people living there um, and people need to be fed. And so my research actually looks just north of the ancient city at the countryside, mm -hmm. where you have a landscape that is in many ways as monumental as, as the city center itself. And so, you know, you do have some temples, you do have some tombs there, but 
what you really have is just an expansive, extremely dense network of cisterns and rock cut canals and um, stone terraces, all of which are there to kind of um, to make the landscape productive for agriculture in a region that only gets 200 millimeters of rainfall um, per year. And so my question is, you know, how does this landscape develop? What is driving its development? Um, and how does it change through time? Um, because there's been a lot of assumptions that because you have all these temples and tombs being built sort of in the Roman period, in the first few century CE, that that's the same time that all this other stuff must be getting built as well. But then, you know, ongoing work is showing that a lot of it seems to have been built a little bit later. Um, even the parts that were built during the Roman period, they seem to have been used for many centuries mm -hmm. after the fact. And for sure, people, local Bedouin communities living in Petra today, continue to farm on these terraces that are, you know, presumably ancient in date. And so I'm really trying to understand um, what that other kind of history is of Petra, the one that's more rural, the one that's more non-elite, the one that's more local, um, and, and how that relates to, to the issues that are facing people at Petra today. So a lot of these terraces are being targeted for um, revitalization and you know, to be rebuilt because there's a water crisis in Jordan, there's dangerous flooding that happens in the winter, and so people are looking at these systems as ancient technology that can be restored. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this also factors very you know, closely into ongoing discussions about climate change and the food crisis. Um, you know, how can we have sustainable agricultural practices? And so I think um, archaeology is very well equipped to kind of give that long-term perspective to, to those questions and say, you know, what is it that we're actually sustaining? Are we talking about nutrients in the soil? Are we talking about um, the sustainability of the local economy, of local you know, traditions and culture? Because um, those aren't always overlapping, and mm -hmm. you can have a very sustainable agricultural practice that is not economically sustainable. And then at the same time, um, a lot of these terraces are within the Petra Archaeological Park, and so then they also become kind of cultural heritage in their own way, and so there's discussions about conservation and preservation, um, and there's an impulse, I think, to try to keep people from using them, when in fact it is the ongoing use of these systems that actually are most um, productive for their preservation. And so all these issues kind of manifest together in, in this study of agriculture um, at Petra um, in this really just amazing landscape that seems to have been in use for the past 2,000 years. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, so when you're looking at like the, the long-term use of agricultural landscape, how easy is it to get... So we, Emily mentioned earlier that um, archaeology is in, an inherently destructive science. Uh, when you excavate, you destroy that obviously you're digging down, so you, you destroy everything on top. How easy is it to get kind of to the earlier levels, the earlier uses of the landscape? It's very difficult. Um, <laughs> studying ancient terraces in particular is sort of notoriously difficult because as Emily said, archeology span is, is kind of inherently destructive, but so is agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about terraces that are being built and rebuilt over centuries that are getting destroyed by floods. Um, that you know are just not being maintained and so failing in that way and so a lot of the conventional approaches such as the ones that emily discussed about you know digging stratigraphically and finding these kinds of close contexts where you can take you know buried remains they don't work so well for for fields because you know people are uh bringing soil from other places to build these terraces the soil is being washed down from the mountain every year farmers are plowing the soil so everything's getting very mixed up um and so it requires a lot of sort of um, collaborative research to, to get, get all the methods together that you need in order to, to date the terraces themselves, but also to understand how they're being used. Mm -hmm. So what we do, what my research focuses on is excavating units, um, you know, immediately behind or in front of these terrace walls, all the way to foundations to see their full stratigraphic profiles. And then from that, we try to understand construction sequences, so whether there's multiple stages of construction, um, or whether it's just one sort of single moment. Um, and then we also use this very uh, fancy method called um, optically stimulated luminescence dating, or OSL, which um, you take a soil sample and then you can measure the time between the present and the last time that sunlight um, exposed those, uh, those sand grains. And so mm -hmm. this tells us kind of, if we, if we sample systematically within the, the profile of a terrace wall, we can see you know, when was it built, when was it kind of in use, and then when did it begin to seemingly you know, fall out of use? Mm -hmm. So it's it's it requires a lot of inference. It requires a lot of digging. Um, it's mostly, I mean, you know, we don't find amazing figurines or anything. <laughs> you don't get fantastic text archives and 
No, there's no there's no inscriptions on the terraces <laughs> that says, you know, I, you know, the, the Roman emperor built this terrace. Um, it's very sort of mundane, but it's actually, it, it's in some ways just as exciting because it's, you're, you're inferring so much from these kinds of clues, like mm -hmm. uh, these, you know, different colors, uh, soil layers, or, um, you know, piles of rocks that seem to indicate previous stages of construction. Um, and once we get these dates from the, the OSL dating, then we can finally sort of connect those to discrete moments in time. So um, you mentioned that the kind of the, the latest dating you have is for, they were built in, in the Roman period, but then used for, for a long time after that. Um, do you have a, an idea or, a, or a, an estimate for how long total these, these areas were in use as agricultural landscape? So first of all, um, so Petra seems to have been occupied at the earliest, maybe the third or fourth century BCE, but the Edomites who were there prior also modified the landscape. And so there are cisterns that are carved in the landscape that are, you know, much earlier, Older. eighth century, ninth century BCE. Um, but it's really only in the maybe the first century CE that you start getting um, a lot of the kind of agricultural intensification that that is indexed by the by the terraces. Um, and yet we know from, from some dates that we've already received that other teams have, have been collecting that a lot of these walls are in fact being built much later in the Byzantine period as well. And so there's immediately this disconnect that you have between when you assume these things are being built, which is during the height of the Roman Empire, and then when the, what the dates are actually telling us, which is that it seems to be being built at a time when Petra is already in decline, mm -hmm. um, that you do have this ruralization that's taking place, that you, you definitely don't have to trade with, you know, to the same extent as you did prior but you still have people very actively invested and engaged in the land, and they're still building these terraces. Additionally, um, Petra disappears from the sort of written records around the 7th century CE. Um, but even after the fact, you have sporadic accounts saying, you know, there are people still living maybe in and around Petra, um, certainly in the medieval period, in the Mammoth period, um, so like 12th century to 16th century. We know there's another phase of intensification that happens in southern Jordan. Um, a lot of it for sugar production, but also just for local wheat and barley. Um, and there are dates that people have been getting that are showing terraces being built even during this medieval period. Mm -hmm. And then, like I said, you know, the local Bedouin are still using and repairing them today. And so it's not hard to imagine a kind of continuous sequence of 2,000 years of people living in this landscape that we otherwise assume is you know, abandoned for mm -hmm. most of this time, um, and still using old Roman and Nabataean terraces, building new ones, reincorporating them. Um, and so the research is very much focused on this long-term sequence and trying to understand how people are, are reusing pre previous modifications. You know, what is the legacy of Roman period investment in the landscape? Um, and how is that directing where people are continuing to, to farm? Because there are some places that seem to be abandoned completely, kind of a single period use. And then there are others that clearly have multiple phases of, of agricultural production. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So it feels like there are maybe maybe two sides of of um the land itself so you've got the the terraces but then you've also you talked about uh water usage um how do you go about investigating ancient waterways yeah that's a great question um so terraces themselves they do have those dual purposes especially at petra like i said it receives 200 millimeters of rainfall a year almost all of it falling during the winter months very seasonal um, and terraces essentially serve two functions they um a lot of them are built across uh, ephemeral water streams, which are called wadis, these, these waterways that are only active when you have these rainstorms. And those serve the function of slowing down the flow of water, which can be very sort of violent and destructive, and distributing it to broader areas. So sometimes that means distributing the water to cisterns for storage, and other times that means just spreading it across fields. Mm -hmm. Once you sort of decrease the slope of, of the gradient, then the water slows down. When the water slows down, it also deposits all of the sediments that it contains. And so those sediments then get deposited behind the terraces and what would otherwise be very thin soils develop into several meters of, in some cases, rich soil that can be used to plant trees and other kinds of crops. And so it's very much a dual action of, of soil management and water management. Um, and so that's what, that's what the terraces do. But then, like you said, you also have canals, which are sort of more, more for water. And those are very hard to date as well, um, because you sort of just have to go off of morphology. But it's interesting to see the way in which, you know, rock-cut canals just seamlessly blend into uh, cement 
viaducts that are being built today or plastic tubing. And so it's definitely a gradual and incremental process. I think from the beginning, I'm trying to think of these things not as synchronic, as single moment modifications, but rather as these long Very much a long term yeah. development. That's absolutely you, fascinating. I've never, um, never really stopped to think about the ways in which um, ancient ruins and ancient technology are being continually integrated into the lives of the people who still inhabit that lands landscape. Mm -hmm. Um, so thank you very much. Um, last question from me, and then we'll go to some audience questions. Um, if you do get funded, what are your summer research plans? So uh, same with Emily. Uh, fieldwork is not uh, likely to happen this summer. Mm -hmm. uh, the season hasn't been fully canceled yet, but it's just not very likely to occur. Should it happen, um, the plan, my plan is to go back to Petra. I've already worked there for two seasons. Um, this would be my third season there. Um, and the research strategy that I developed is you pick this large, we've picked this large rural landscape in North of Petra and we're sampling parts of it very sort of strategically. Um, the upper part of the watershed, the middle part, and the lower part. And in each of these areas, you have very dense networks of terraces, um, but they are different in appearance and seemingly in function. And so if we can try to understand, you know, what the local histories of agriculture are in each of these places, that we can sort of build this greater narrative of how the overall system uh, used to work and why certain areas were abandoned whereas others weren't mm -hmm. or were abandoned. And so if I am able to go back this summer, then we will be working in the, um, the, the upper part of the watershed system where you have completely different walls than anywhere else. These very long, like 500 meter long, two meter high walls that just completely follow the contours um, and seem to be doing something very different than what we're seeing in other areas. And so we will excavate them. Um, collect samples for dating um, and just, you know, add more data to the overall data set. Mm -hmm. uh, should that not happen, um, the, the other side of this research is, so one side of the research, like I said, is chronology. The other side of this is the social context. So understanding, you know, what is the system of land management and local economy, rural economy during all of these periods. And usually that's very difficult to access archeologically, but at Petra we're very fortunate because there are, um, several archives of documents from different periods in time that have preserved. So from the sort of first, second century CE, covering the transition from the, the Nabataean kingdom to the Roman Empire, we have the Babatha archive, which is a collection of papyri from the Dead Sea that are almost entirely about rural production within this area of, not at Petra, but of Nabataea itself. And so they talk about you know, what people are growing on the land, how they're uh, selling and dividing the land, um, who's responsible for maintaining canals, who has access to water at different times. Um, and this is information that's really useful for understanding, you know, how people were actually in this landscape and how they were using this, this infrastructure. Um, from the 7th century, you have the Nisana papyri from the Nisana in the Negev, which covers, again, very conveniently the transition from the Byzantine to the early Islamic period. Um, and so same thing there, it deals very closely with agricultural um, issues. And then finally, there's the Petra papyri, which are from Petra itself, which are from the sixth century. And those, again, are very detailed documents about land tenure and land ownership and selling property. Um, and so you have these, these three from the time that Petra was actually occupied. And then additionally, there is a whole bunch of documents from the Mamluk period, from the medieval period, that again deal with land ownership during the um, during the medieval period within southern Jordan. And so whether or not I do fieldwork or not, one thing that I definitely want to do is deep dive into all of these documents and really just read. I mean, you know, I've, I've read parts of some, I've, I've read articles sort of about them, but mm -hmm. really just go through them systematically and, and mine them for, for everything I can to try to understand what is the logic behind investments in certain places. You know, what are the what are the motivations that are driving a lot of these rural communities when they're when they're using the land? You know, what is the intersection of political authority, religious authority? economic opportunity. Um, a lot of these details are there, but they're very fragmented across all these sources. And so I, I'd really like to spend, you know, what would be this whole summer, essentially, just bringing that all together and really thinking through all of that. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so everyone, if you have questions for Daniel, please put them in the side chat. Um, Josh has left the room. Uh, he's going to be uh, joining us elsewhere because our son just woke up and having a two-year-old in the recording studio while we're live is 
amusing, but not terribly productive. So he's on child watch duty and he's going to be sending me uh, questions as they come in. So if you have questions for Daniel, please put them in the side chat, tag us at Digital Hammurabi, and we will uh, ask as many of them as we can. Um, so uh, when collecting samples for thermoluminescence dating, how do you ensure they are not exposed to sunlight? Yeah, this is a great question. And it's, it's, a, it's actually kind of silly to watch in practice because um, if, if they're exposed to sunlight before you can process them, then you've essentially ruined the sample. The date you'll get is you know, zero years ago. Um, and so there are lots of different um, ways that people advise you to collect these samples. And this is still very much like a kind of new and developing technique. Um, and so there's some disagreement. But the way we do it is we have these long tubes that are either uh, metal or PPC, depending on the material we have access to. And from the stratigraphy that we want to sample, we hammer those in to the profile. And a lot of these sediments are extremely dense, very solidified, you know, hard clays or sand. And so hammering each of these in can take up to an hour, sometimes, wow. sometimes more. It's extremely exhausting. Um, but you have to hammer them all the way in, and then we cap the end of it that's mm -hmm. on the outside. Then we return in the night under darkness, <laughs> and we, we have headlamps with uh, with red uh, light, lower frequency light, um, and we have to extract them. Mm -hmm. And that's also not easy to do in some cases. <laughs> and also, being in the desert at night is not super fun because that's when all the scorpions come out and Oof. all the other uh, wildlife. And so we extract the tubes under cover of darkness, essentially, and then seal the other end. And then we send these tubes, which look very suspicious when you're sending them internationally <laughs> um, to the labs that process them. And then what they essentially do is they sample the soil from in the, the center of that tube, mm -hmm. which is you know as, as dark as it can be. Um, and then additionally, we have to collect soil from around the area, so they have kind of a baseline exposure um, to help calibrate the dates. Mm -hmm. But the dating is exceptional. I mean, for, for that kind of technique, we expect an error range of maybe one to 200 years, which oh. sounds like a lot, but that's again it, within a time span precise, of two thousand yeah. years. Yeah, it's it's pretty good, and it's it's almost on par with what we get from radiocarbon, which can be also you know fifty to one hundred years in some cases. Fantastic, thank you. I learned something new today. Uh, um, so, a question from Chip: um, As Petra is rather a large site, what are the closest ruins to the terrace sites that you're excavating? Uh, yeah, so it's very difficult to really define the boundaries of Petra itself. Um, if you could take the sort of well-beaten forest path, you come in through the, the Seek, the kind of monumental deep canyon um, passageway, and then you enter the city center, and there's the kind of downtown Petra, which has all the huge palaces and, and most, the most iconic kind of structures. Um, but then as you move further out into the countryside, both north and south, it really doesn't end. I mean, you still get tombs pretty far out. About five kilometers south of Petra is a site called Sabra, which has a Roman theater, bathhouse, um, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, and there's tombs more or less along the whole way. And then heading north to where, um, to where my research takes place, again, all of these wadi systems, these like deep canyons that water flows through, all of them are lined with wine presses, cisterns, terraces, tombs. Um, and, you know, there is a decrease in density as you go further out, but again, five kilometers north of Petra is this city called Data, which um, was occupied in the Neolithic, it's occupied in the Islamic period, it was almost certainly occupied during the Roman period, um, and it's probably some kind of suburb of, mm -hmm. of Petra. And it's right actually next to a site that's called Little Petra, which is, you know, a very similar sort of site to Petra itself. And so it's, it's unclear whether we're in this, like, hinterland or like peri-urban agricultural area. Um, and I don't think those definitions mattered so much to the people themselves at, at the time because they're moving around the landscape a lot. Anyway, from these documents, the, like the Petra Papyri, we know that you have people living at Petra who own land as far away as Gaza, further south of Petra. I mean, the, the land holding is very dispersed, and so you can imagine they're all traveling around quite a bit. Um, and so, yeah, so in the north, uh, northern hinterlands where we're working, there are tombs and there are sort of like religious reliefs. There's a site called Basel Slaisel, which seems to be this very prominent Nabataean sanctuary site, which is right, right in the center kind of where we're working, completely covered and surrounded by terraces. Um, and so again, there's this very interesting intersection between religious landscapes and agricultural landscapes that I don't think it's productive to, to keep separate. I mean, they're clearly
clearly all related to each other, um, which is again why it's important to consider the social dimensions of agriculture, not just the kind of environmental. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so uh, how do you supplement your archaeological knowledge for such a specific purpose? Um, are insights from current day agriculture or irrigation experts valuable for these kinds of questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's been some excellent ethnographies that have been done on the Bedouin today, sort of how they're using the land. I mean, those are clearly very informative for understanding um, how people in the past might have used this landscape. Um, and then there's also sort of broader discussions about um, a lot of the literature about what makes the system sustainable does in fact come from fields outside archaeology, as you would expect. I mean, this is a major um, issue that people are talking about in economics and in you know, environmental studies. Um, and so a lot of those dis discussions get brought into my work quite clearly. Um, because again, I don't think it's, it's necessarily productive to think of this as ancient agriculture versus modern agriculture, especially if we're thinking of this as a continual process. And so, you know, the, 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 the forces that are driving people today are very likely to be the same that were driving people in the past, at least in types, if not specifically. Mm -hmm. You know, the Roman Empire gets replaced by the Mamluk Empire, but kind of life goes on in between and during that time. Um, and so, yeah, uh, uh, it, it, it's sort of necessarily transdisciplinary in terms of the, the scholarship that I'm reading on mm -hmm. the topic. What, uh, this is my own question, uh, what, yeah. um, what other members of your team are there? Is it, are you all purely archaeologists or do you have um, a variety of people that, that come out and consult with you? Yeah, and I, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this earlier. So I'm working as part of the, the Petra Terraces Archaeological Project, which, as the name suggests, is just focused very much on the terraces themselves. Um, and the project is made up of archaeologists, um, geoarchaeologists, so geologists. Um, we have specialists that you know are specific for like ceramics or for the lithics that we find. Um, but over the years that we worked there, we've also um, collaborated with uh, local Jordanian um, scholars who are working on revitalizing these terraces. So there's been a lot of kind of um, sharing of information in that way. And then we've also been experimenting a lot with um, documentation techniques. So, you know, documenting the terrace systems of Petra is actually really challenging because everything, especially in August, everything is kind of just yellow. It's all sandstone. You have sandstone rocks, sand, and it's all the same color. And so, you know, a simple photograph doesn't really capture the intricacy of that whole system. And so we've experimented with things like photogrammetry, um, with aerial photography, and then we've also had actual artists um, and architects come on the project and do like watercolor paintings and sketches to try to show, you know, the salient elements of the landscape, if not every single detail. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's very transdisciplinary, not just in the sciences, you know, with the specialists that we work with, but also, you know, with a lot of more humanities sided um, disciplines like, you know, architecture and art. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we, we kind of covered this, but I'm going to, to ask it anyway. Um, can you describe the methods of irrigation used for terrace farms, Spe specifically any evidence you've uncovered for underground aqueducts or rock-cut aquifers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, yeah, the, the primary means of irrigation at Petra um, is through rainfall harvesting. And so you have rain that's falling over this large area. Um, because so much of it is exposed bedrock, you have this high runoff coefficient. And so you have a lot of water that just essentially falls off of the rocks that it falls on. And so um, everywhere you look, and I mean this quite literally, <laughs> everywhere you look, um, you see these tiny little modifications, these little canals that are carved, all of which divert you know, what seems to be an almost insignificant amount of water, rainwater, um, into progressively larger and larger flows that then flow into cisterns that can be, you know, several meters deep and stored, you know, I don't know how many metric uh, meters of water. Um, and so you have rainwater harvesting in that way. You also have springs in the area of Petra. I mean, people like to say Petra is a you know, desert city, but, you know, relative to other areas, it's actually somewhat well watered. I mean, there are a lot of springs. And so all of those have been historically tapped and directed into these rock cut canals. Um, at Petra, there aren't any, um, as far as I'm aware, any like underground uh, aqueducts, um, like these Kanat systems, which you see actually just a couple of kilometers east of Petra at the site called uh, Udru. You do have these Kanat systems that bring water from mountain springs all the way to the city. Uh, you don't have those at Petra, but you do have kind of overground water canals um, that bring water everywhere. And then again, you have a lot of wadis that all seem to congregate on the city itself. And those 
those have all been modified and blocked and, and exploited to, to capture truly, like it seems like every single drop of water that falls, um, et cetera. It's a very effective and efficient system. Mm -hmm. That sounds like it would have to be. That's it, the, the um, hearing you described the, the little like rivulets of water is, that sounds yeah. really fascinating. Yeah. Um, and I would love to have the chance to be there kind of in the winter one day to actually see, see them their action. videos. I mean, the, the floods are, they're dangerous and mm -hmm. they cause damage and, and people in the, in the past actually died. Um, and so there is a concern on the part of the authorities, not just in you know harvesting rainwater, but actually diverting it away from the city so it doesn't damage um, the monuments and the, um, and the tourists that come to visit it. But it, it must be an amazing sight to see all this water suddenly appear mm -hmm. in the desert. Um, okay, we have one last question, then I will let you get on with your day. Um, uh, so uh, a not widely accepted hypothesis claims that the orientation of early Islamic mosques pointed to Petra and not the current Mecca. Does your research indicate enough food could be produced to support a pilgrimage to Petra in the early Islamic period? Hmm, yeah, so I don't know that I'm qualified to say anything about the orientation of mosques. Uh, during the early Islamic period. Um, for sure, there's a lot of connections between late Nabataean society and early kind of Southern Arabian um, Islamic society, both in terms of the language and also some kind of cultural carryovers. Um, but it, just speaking in terms of the food production in the area, um, it seems like it would have been a pretty productive area, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, certainly during the Roman period, um, it looks like a lot of the production is not even towards subsistence crops, like the ones that you would need to just basically survive. A lot of it seems to be towards date palm cultivation. Um, and so when you do have that kind of specialized crop production that has more of an economic value than a, than a subsistence one, then it's clear that people aren't you know, starving. People aren't at starvation levels. And mm. this isn't like a desperate attempt to, to you know, eke out a living in the, in the desert. This is very much like a kind of sustainable economic um, enterprise. And so I don't, I mean, I don't think Petra was ever the breadbasket of any kind of polity. Um, for sure, agriculture in Egypt and Syria greatly dwarfed whatever Petra produced, um, both in terms of, you know, wine and also cereal crops. But I, I think people at Petra and in the surrounding area were probably fairly comfortable when it came to, you know, local food resources. Mm -hmm. um, and as for pilgrimages to, to Mecca or Medina, um, for sure they would have passed kind of through that area. Um, and I don't know, yeah, I, I can't say how, how significantly Petra sustained mm. that, but I think it wouldn't have hurt it too much to help. Would, would, do you think there would have been enough um, produce to, to look at an export market? I think there would, so overland transport would have been very expensive okay. in the ancient world, as much as it is today. And so I, I don't, I think there would have been enough to export, I just don't know that anybody would be interested in bearing that cost mm -hmm. because I, there is evidence of wine I and mean, we have wine presses at Petra clearly they were producing wine in some amount of quantities in some quantities but um, there's no indication that Petra was ever like a major wine exporting region um, and even the sh sort of short-lived sugar um, enterprise that took place there in the medieval period was also fairly short-lived because mm -hmm. sugar requires a lot of water um, and so I do think it was probably more kind of local local needs and local um, produce. I see. So the, the canals um, that we're that you're looking at were first and foremost for agricultural purposes. They wouldn't have been used for any kind of transport systems. Yeah, they're, they're, they're very narrow and small. Okay. And so they would have been for either watering fields or for kind of gathering potable water. And there's a distinction there between water for human consumption and water for, you know, for crops or for animals. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Well, that that is, um, I think, us done. Thank you so much. This Thanks I so love these interviews because I get to talk to people that are completely outside my own specialism, and I learn so much. Uh, I greatly enjoyed that, and we had some wonderful questions from the audience. So, Dan, thank you very much again, yeah. um, so and much. we will be in touch. Great. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Yeah. Okay. So that was Daniel Plakov. Um, thank you very much, Dan. Greatly enjoyed that. I think everyone else is enjoying this as well, uh, judging, again, by the quality of questions that we've got. Um, we have maybe f three or four minutes before um, our next participant is due to come in. Um, so I'm going to take just two minutes um, and say, if you are interested in HAPS, in supporting the work that we're doing, I completely understand that now is really, really bad time to be soliciting donations. 
because there's a pandemic on and everyone is uh, confined to their homes and people are having difficulty getting work and continuing with their normal uh, means of employment. Um, If you do have spare money and would like to support us, there is the Donate Here thing scrolling across the bottom of your screen. Uh, We take one-time donations via PayPal or we do also have a patron account specifically for HAPS excuse me, everything that goes through that account goes directly to the students minus patrons fees. um, And that is www.patreon.com forward slash HAPS fund. Uh, If understandably you have no spare change right now, um, it greatly helps us if you just share these videos out. Um, One of the whole points of this is one of the whole points. The main point of this is to help get good research out to non-specialists who are interested in the ancient world and maybe don't have the knowledge of how to access it. Um, Just if you have someone that you think would be interested in it, share this video, share um, what we're doing here. We just we just really just want to share this information um, and help these students uh, get their research to a wider audience. That would be incredibly helpful um and finally i am and i if you've watched much of us before you'll know this i am in the process of converting haps into an official non-profit um the forms are filled out i'm waiting on a couple of bits of additional information from um, an accountant that is very kindly working with us um so what that means is hopefully by the end of the summer all donations made to haps will be Uh, tax deductible for at least the US. I don't know how it would work internationally, um, but it will be, we will be an official charity, an official nonprofit. Um, I'm building a website to uh, help promote it. Um, So if you do um, want to contribute to HAPS and you're going to wait until after the summer, let me know because I can send you all of the relevant um, letters and documentation for you to send in with your taxes to say, look, I gave a charitable donation. Um, so that is all very exciting. Um, I love this. This is just wonderful. I love what I do. Um, so we are going to move on to our third and final applicant for the day. Just have to wait for the computer to catch up with us. Hello, and let me get the right name up. And let me make sure that we can hear you. Ah, so you are not showing as having a microphone. I can see you. I'm assuming you can hear me, but we don't have a micro. I can't unmute you on this end. Do you have a microphone connected? Um. Sorry, everyone. There is always some kind of technical issue which is unfortunate when working over the internet let me see is is there like a a microphone icon on your screen anywhere Mm -mm. normally zoom gives me an option to unmute people but it's not even showing a microphone sorry everyone oh no I think that was me. Yes. Naama, can you hear me? Yeah. And can I hear you? Uh, I don't know. Yes, can you? I can hear I you. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and I can't hear myself, which is perfect because I don't want to hear myself because that is just strange. And then we have an echo. Everyone, this is Naama Walsa. Thank you so much for joining us. Am I saying your name right? Uh, yeah, pretty much. I will take that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us. I'm sorry we had that slight technical hiccup. Um, it always happens. I normally start the stream with myself muted and I talk for a good five minutes and then realize I'm just talking to an empty room because no one can hear me. Uh, <laughs> so welcome. It is very nice to meet you. Um, would you mind just giving everyone a bit of information about yourself and how you got into the field? Yeah, sure. Um, well, 
My name is Nama, as he said. I've been at Tel Aviv University for quite some time since my BA. I just started my PhD. Um, I think our school systems is just slightly different uh, here in Israel than it is maybe in the States. Uh, so really, once you start your BA, you're already, you've chosen what you want to do. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing just, B, just archaeology since my first year of my BA. That's how it works here. Um, yeah, I don't, I really have no good answer why I chose to do a BA in archaeology. Um, but it's been working out and I like it. So I've stuck to it. Uh, I've been working with Professor Israel Finkelstein since the last year of my BA and he's been my advisor for my MA. And now as an advisor with Professor Asafia Solando uh, for my PhD. Fantastic. Now, we have a, a similar um, university system in the UK. I start, my BA was in ancient history um, and I just kind of stuck with that all the way through. Um, coming in and doing a PhD in the States and finding out about how much diversity there is just in one undergrad class um, was actually absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm not sure how well I'd have coped with that much <laughs> choice. <laughs> um, so um, thank you for that. Could you um, maybe talk a little bit about your current specialism and, and what you're looking at for your PhD? Yeah, so I specialize in the Intermediate Bronze Age and then the transition into the Middle Bronze Age now at Tel Megiddo, which is where I dig usually. Uh, the Intermediate Bronze Age is really fascinating, and I think it's a really fascinating time to be part of the study of the Intermediate Bronze Age uh, because it's a non-urban interlude between the Early Bronze Age, the EB, and the Middle Bronze Age, which I do just refer to as the MB. Uh, and for many years, it was just thought to be a really short, kind of not really interesting period. So we didn't, and we couldn't find these settlements of the Intermediate Bronze Age. And people just assumed that people migrated elsewhere were just, we really, they really didn't know what was happening. Uh, sometime around 2012, a really big project was published from the Weizmann Institute and showed that the Intermediate Bronze Age is actually 500 years long. So much longer and wider in terms of geography than anybody thought before. And just because of, modern urban expansion in modern Israel, we've they started finding all these settlement sites. They're just not on the big tell stratified sites that we know um, for everything else, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a really interesting time when people are starting to notice and say, okay, maybe the Intermediate Bronze Age is of some significance because mm -hmm. it is 500 years uh, long and we just really don't know what was happening. So for my MA, I published one of these unknown, like previously unknown settlement sites that was excavated way back in the 90s and just kind of put in a box and everybody, nobody noticed it because it was from this uninteresting mm -hmm. period. But now everybody started paying attention. So I had a chance to work on these old boxes um, and since I dig at Tel Megiddo uh, in 2018, I excavated in the gate area, the Middle Bronze Age gate area, just right under where Chicago left off in the 1930s. And we found really, really early Middle Bronze Age strata. So when we're turning from the non-urban intermediate Bronze Age, then most people, because most people work on these large stratified tell sites, mm -hmm. they see the Middle Bronze Age in its full blast urban kind of entity. We don't, we can't really find the transition because people aren't just non-urban one day and then become urban mm -hmm. the next. But we haven't been finding these transitional areas or contexts. And so we were really lucky to start finding these. Um, and through the 2018 season, I kind of, I was pushing because this, this pottery wasn't looking like something we've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. And I managed to convince uh, Professor Finkelstein that it's IBA MB transitional pottery. That's awesome. <laughs> so he was like, okay, if you've convinced me and now write your PhD on it. So this is what I've been trying to do. That's fantastic. So how many, um, how many sites have you uh, uncovered this uh, transitional pottery from? 
Well, this is just the oh, one. This because, is just the one. I see. Yeah. So I dig at Megiddo. We dig uh, one year at one summer at Megiddo, and then one summer at Tel Kirat Yarim, which is Roman and Iron Age, and okay. and the whole other Completely side. Completely different. Near Jerusalem. Yeah. yeah, it's near Jerusalem, whereas Tel Megiddo is in the Jezreel Valley, it's in northern Israel. So pretty big stratified site. Most people who do archaeology have heard of it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we just have this, and it's also really interesting because again it's kind of a revival of interest in the general academic world in the intermediate bronze age in the earlier parts of the middle bronze age um that's happening now so it's really great to be just part of of that in general mm -hmm. and nobody's really looked at the middle bronze age at tel megiddo i think since the early 1980s so even just doing that is it's ready for some fresh eyes yeah with all the new technology and the all the things we do as part of the Tel Megiddo excavation. That's really fantastic. Um, do you have plans to um, open trenches elsewhere apart from the gates to, to see if you can find this same settlement there? So at Tel Megiddo, since it is such a big site, and we dig on really high resolution, I mean, we take samples for every sort of lab and we have collaborations with really hundreds of labs around the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, we don't we open up rather smaller areas in different parts of the tell, and each area tackles a, a different research question. So the other area, it's an there's a domestic area in area K. Um, they hit the Middle Bronze Age, but right now they're in the middle MB two, I guess. So we're still almost two hundred years apart from mm -hmm. our area and area S at the gate area. But it really, it was all kind of depending on this summer and seeing what we hit this summer. And mm -hmm. we're not really sure <laughs> if we're going to be digging this summer and if we do, to what extent. Mm -hmm. And so, we'll, um, I'll, we'll, we'll move on to that in a second. I wanted to ask briefly, do you, you mentioned that a lot of these smaller settlement sites um, that um, were occupied during the intermediate period have been kind of overlooked and, and left in boxes. Do you have a, a feeling for how many sites maybe we're talking about that represent this time period? Hundreds. Oh, wow. Okay. And because I, I work within Israel, it's kind of hard for us to, to work outside as mm -hmm. an Israeli. Um, so what's another fascinating thing about the intermediate bronze age is so regional, so different. So mm -hmm. my friend, for example, Zach Dunseth, he works in the Negev and his, even just the pottery looks completely different. And, or people who work for my MA, I focused on the, on the Judean Shefela. So it's where the Judean hills kind of slope into the, the coastal plain. It's that transitional place, uh, area. Uh, and so my things look completely different than people who work in, in Jerusalem, for mm -hmm. example. So it's really, really regional, distinctive kind of material culture from one place to another. So just in the Shvila, when I started just collecting data for my MA, it's really hundreds of sites. Mm -hmm. And then there are people who've been working on the Jezreel Valley, who I, I started working with now because my, for my PhD, I am moving to the uh, Jezreel Valley for this uh, period, again, just they have hundreds and hundreds of sites, some of them excavated as salvage excavations, and just kind of put in boxes again, because mm -hmm. it, it wasn't as interesting. And it's difficult with the Intermediate Bronze Age in terms of chronology and relative chronology, because there's single strata in sites. Oh, so, okay. So you don't have any of the, um, maybe the chronological context to help date everything no. relatively no not at the moment but i think this is one of the things i've been working on and now i'm publishing so hopefully it'll be out really soon is i think at the moment i have just studying it for so long and looking at these assemblages for so long just by sheer typology and looking at an assemblage as a whole to so I think we can now, just by ceramic typology, know if the site is earlier or later within the Intermediate Bronze Age. Okay. So that's something that's really novel. It hasn't been done before. Mm -hmm. and But it couldn't have been a static period. I mean, I don't think 
human nature stays static for 500 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be so, very surprising. Yeah. So if, um, if you do get uh, funding through HAPS, what are your, your research plans for the summer? So again, there was supposed to be a Megiddo season. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't, we're not really sure what's happening with that. Um, but there are a few other projects that I've been, I've joined lately mm -hmm. uh, or not so lately, some of them, uh, other than my, my own research and mm -hmm. my PhD proposal. So um, I've been part, I've been really lucky to be part of um, a community archaeology program in the city of Lod, which is not, they haven't been as fortunate maybe in terms of just the socioeconomical background of most of the people who live there. Mm -hmm. And so I teach 10th graders in one of the high schools. Um, and everything is, it, I teach them archaeology, but everything goes back to the city of Lod. It's one of the most fascinating cities. I mean, so when I teach about the Roman period, I teach Roman period in the city, in mm -hmm. their city, and kind of try to connect them to where they are and, and see. So I have to make my new, all my new lesson plans for next year. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm part of the Levantine Ceramic Project, the LCP which is an open source, it's online, so it's something we can all benefit from. Mm -hmm. And the more scholars kind of put in their data on the website into this huge database that's been building, the more beneficial it is for everybody because it kind of helps us and we can look at what other, other people are doing and not have to, you know, as scholars, we sometimes we end up doing things again, even though somebody else is did it or mm -hmm. these databases they just don't exist there's no place for me to go look what's all the pottery that's been found from this period within a geographic region mm -hmm. we don't have these so i think the lcp is really great in doing that and connecting it to petrography to these soil samples too so it is accessible to everybody around the world mm -hmm. that those sound like two very um important and useful projects um what I'm going to go on a slight tangent here. Uh, what, what do your high schoolers make of, of the archaeology and of learning about their city's like really ancient past? I think it's, I think, well, sometimes I'm like, I, I think it's crazy that they don't know the, the history of where they live. But mm -hmm. honestly, I didn't know about it. And it's 20 minutes away from where I live. And I didn't know the Romans called this place Diospolis, like the city of God. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the city today, you wouldn't maybe have guessed, but the largest Roman villas and the nicest uh, mosaics that's traveling around the world, I think it's in the Louvre now, it was in New York, um, were found in Lod and just St. George, who's the patron saint of England mm -hmm. and, you know, Georgia, he's buried in Lod. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so, and it was really important for, when the Muslims conquered um, this region, it was one of their capitals. So it is so significant, has so much important history. And even from, so from the Neolithic, when you look at Israeli scholars who study the Neolithic, they're, they always refer to Lod as kind of the, the type site for mm -hmm. the Neolithic within this region. So, and it was continuously occupied. Oh, wow. And I think, yeah, so... Since the Neolithic until today, Lod was continuously occupied. It's one of the only cities, I think, in Israel. That is that amazing. That. Um, so I think when they, I think my enthusiasm is <laughs> catching on <laughs> to them as well. And the students this year, I mean, they're, they're super invested. They even have their own Instagram now called Ancient Lod. And, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, so they, they try and we're trying to, I'm just, I think it's a way to connect and have pride in, and where they live. And I think once you have that, even if it doesn't seem like it's the best place to live right now, you have, you have pride in where you live and you're part of the archaeology that's going on because the digs are going on around them, but they have no idea what people are digging mm -hmm. up because it's so, I think it's really important. No, that I, I agree. Is there chances for them to get involved in archaeological digs in Lod or is it kind of close Yeah, yeah off? we do. Oh, we fantastic. Do, do. It's part of what we do. So um yeah so again fortunate enough because there are active digs so sometimes during the year we go out but then during um the spring break it was supposed to be now or the yeah. passover break uh, we have both in lord there you know just because of israeli antiquity laws things 
buildings that are considered just for that are they're kept by the municipality that are less than 400 years old and then we can kind of go into them and just the cleaning and so it's really and some of them are just still standing i mean mm -hmm. from the early ottoman period you know they used to make soap in one of them so we learn about ancient crafts that were going on around in the region and then actual old dig like digs that that the things that are coming out from them are dated way back to again from the neolithic until today mm -hmm. that's fascinating yeah. oh i'm jealous of your students that sounds like a fan uh, just a fantastic opportunity for for high schoolers oh wonderful um Okay, so I'm going to move on to questions from the audience. We have had a couple um, come through. Um, the first one, could you uh, just give a, classific a clarification on what you mean by Middle Bronze? How is that characterized and what like, like dating are we talking about? So again, it's, it starts when, this, when the IBA, when the Intermediate Bronze Age kind of finishes. So it's around 2000 BC and it's the the revival of the urban landscape or the tell centric, the tell again is this major site, um, the strata, the big stratified site. So it's the rejuvenation or the, the, the reintroduction of an urban system into the Southern Levant. Mm -hmm. um, it coincides, usually people refer to it or the dating traditionally has been focused with the, um, the middle kingdom uh, in Egypt. And that's where the dates have been coming from. Uh, luckily at Megiddo, we have new dates. So that was, that's going to be part of my PhD. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't just have these strata that you can see the material culture of people moving back into the tell after 500 years, but I also have dates to back it up. And I don't have to rely on outside sources and outside dates. That's amazing. I, that's some really exciting research. I'm thrilled for you. Like. <laughs> Um, uh, so when language first appeared on the ceramics you discovered, what script was it w written in and what common words were used? We don't have, I don't, no I don't script. have any awesome. textual material. No, or, or at least, yeah. And again, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm I come from the field. I, that's my, my expertise. I'm a field archeologist mm -hmm. first of all. So, and I like to do pottery. So, and typology. So. Excellent. Um, more textual questions um with the so going oh gosh these questions are a little bit off what we've discussed so if you can't we'll answer them just it. go for it um with the graves that were discovered what insights can be learned from dna testing of the bones um i guess this is referring to or well, again with the intermediate bronze age we couldn't find the settlements first and when i say we i mean archaeologists mm -hmm. i it wasn't me digging in the 1920s, obviously. <laughs> um, so, but, so the settlements weren't found, but initially what they had found were these really large cemeteries. So you can find them in really major sites like Lachish, Tel Megiddo, um, and really just scattered all around. Um, so we haven't been, I, well, at least I haven't been doing any of the DNA mm -hmm. um, tests. I, I haven't dug any of the, the burials. Again, they were dug by Chicago in the 1930s, at least at Tel Megiddo. Um, but as part of the, the larger Megiddo expedition, which I am, I am part of and have been part of for the last few years, we do some ancient DNA. There's a new lab that was just built at Tel Aviv Ooh. University, which is really cool. And again, it's from most of the bones and stuff that's been studied is from the other site of side of the tell. So mm -hmm. it's area, it's what referred to as area K, if anybody knows Tel Megiddo. Um, and a lot of the animal bones have been, they've been doing the ancient DNA for, but none of the things that I work mm -hmm. on right now. So um this is my own question, but going back to, to the what you managed to excavate of the gate area, um, aside from the pottery, what what kinds of of uh, things did you come up with, or was it just mainly pottery? So we have really cool area, I think. <laughs> well, you know, I have to think that I guess. Um, we found so it's the really early the first MB gate, and along around it, it's it doesn't look urban. These people are coming in on the, on the one hand, they're pottery 
and everything around them looks MB ish mm-hmm. in, in its feel, but they're squatters. It looks like they're building really just a few stones and making, calling it a wall. And so it doesn't look like this proper, nice mm-hmm. middle bronze age stuff that we're used to seeing, even though their pottery is middle bronze yeah. age. And we've been lucky enough. There is an, one of the squares is a full on kitchen. I mean, really? you can see the stones lying around these, what were these large pots. And one of the things that we find right at this happens, I think to every archeologist at the the last two, three days of the 2018 season, we found the lines and we started tracing of two really big pottery kilns. Oh. So we decided we only had two, three days left and it wasn't Leave possible. Leave it until so next we year. we left it until this season. And so that was supposed to be oh, part of our first no. summer. Um, but you know, it, it'll always be there. And I, I think I am lucky enough because I do live in Israel, uh, that if it's, we don't have our, you know, our regular season with our hundred volunteers from all over the world, maybe some funding will come in and we can do just a few of us mm-hmm. Later in the year. excavation, yeah. <laughs> which we do sometimes. We're mm-hmm. lucky enough to be able to do that. Um, oh, so it sounds like actually what you're working on is just a very exciting um section of the site is. wow i think it is i hope i hope it's contagious to other people and they'll join me in my mini season <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure they will um we have uh, someone asking if you found any weapons in the we case have. Mm-hmm. oh we have um they're actually one of the most typical things of the Middle Bronze Age, and it's something I have been exploring a little bit. A lot of the burials in the Middle Bronze Age, they, they're referred to in, in, by academics as warrior burials mm-hmm. because there are weapons within these tombs. Um, and the, the weapons that we have are actually, and it, I get, sorry, I think I have to go a step back. And during the MB, a lot of times they were people were buried under the floors of houses. Okay. So the tombs that we have are actually from our, a higher strata than what we're actually digging because they were cut from the floors. They were dug that are, down. Yeah, that were removed already by Chicago. So mm-hmm. I don't have the original floors, but what I, I have are... The these, burials that would have been underneath yeah. the, the pre-existing yeah. houses, I see. So we have these, and, and so... They're from a slightly later phase within the MB than mm-hmm. what I am digging. I so see. we have those and I have the context for them mm-hmm. because Chicago did publish and I know where they're associated with, but they're not part of my PhD mm-hmm. just because they are just slightly later. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Well, that is actually all the questions that I had from the audience and all the questions I had for myself. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. This is, ah, oh, this is exciting. Oh, <laughs> I really hope that you can, um, if not this summer, but um, maybe later after everything has calmed down, get back out there and and uncover your kilns. Yeah, me too. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you again for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, Thank thank you. you. Have a happy Passover. Oh, you too. And we will be in touch. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Bye. Wow. Okay. We have some... So we're three applicants in. I think we've had a total of 12 or 13 applications. Um, And I am just so excited about all of the wonderful research that's being carried out. Ah, I hope everyone else is excited as well. I'm excited. And we all know that we do this purely for my benefit. So that's fine. Anyway, uh, I don't have anything else for you. Thank you all for joining me. Thank you for bringing your wonderful questions. Um, thank you to our three guests for coming and and being willing to talk to us. I know that this is um, a little bit of an unusual uh, stipulation for a grant, but I think it's incredibly important and I genuinely appreciate everyone's uh, willingness and enthusiasm um, for the process and for for coming and and talking to our wonderful audience. Uh, We will be back next Saturday at the same time with three more interviews. Um, I have, I think we're scheduled through the end of April um, and our application 
window doesn't close for another two weeks. It was supposed to close yesterday, um, but because of the pandemic and because everyone is experiencing some level of upheaval, uh, we extended the deadline. So we have two more weeks. If you wish to apply to HAPS, please do. The information is on our website, uh, www.digitalhammurabi.com. I think it's forward slash HAPS fund, but if you just go to digitalhammurabi.com and click on uh, the HAPS scholarship link at the top, there's a, an application pl- page um we're still taking applications so we're having interviews on saturdays at least through the end of april possibly into may um although depending on how many applications we get in i might start interviewing on sundays as well because we're a little bit late in the year and i want to be able to give successful applicants um their grant money sooner rather than later so Thank you all for joining me. Thank you to Josh for sending questions through in such a timely manner. Thank you to our applicants for being amazing. And join me next Saturday. Um, Yeah. Until next time. Resist poor scholarship. Always ask, how do you know that? Bye, guys.